Hello, I'm John O'Hanion, and I'm excited to share with you the results from our paper entitled Embedded Fiber Optic SHM Sensors for Inflatable Space Habitats. My co-authors are Matt Davis from Luna Innovations, Jeff Valania and Ben Sorensen from Sierra Nevada Corporation, Megan Dixon and Matt Morgan from ILC Dover, and Doug Lidikin from NASA Johnson Space Center. This is part of the Lunar and Cislunar Habitat session. Whenever I start a project, I always ask, why is this important? For human space exploration, one of the fundamental principles is preserving human life, and keeping our astronauts safe. We need safe transportation and habitation solutions for every future manned mission. On the other side, there are constraints, weight, is a driving parameter, as anyone familiar with Space Launch knows. Inflatable structures give the highest ratio of living volume to launch weight. For this reason, this cost-effective solution is being evaluated for future missions like Lunar Gateway and Mars missions. However, these flexible structures do raise some concerns. Are they safe? Are they reliable? And that's where structural health monitoring, or SHM, comes in. These flexible materials are challenging to instrument with sensors, but it will be essential for ensuring astronaut safety. The two main mechanisms of failure of these flexible inflatable structures are creep in the Vectran webbing and micrometeoroid impacts. To solve this problem, we've developed a technique to embed high definition fiber optic sensors into the Vectran webbings that make up the structural restraint layer. Over on the left is a conceptual image of an inflatable habitat with fiber optic sensors spanning the structure to monitor its health. The zoom in of the stack up of soft goods layer shows the bladders, the restraint layer, and then the MMOD shielding and exterior cover. Our high definition sensors would be in the restraint layer made up of Vectran or Kevlar webbing. The fiber optic sensors provide distributed measurements of strain of te and temperature uh, with data spacing of 0.65 millimeters along a 10 meter sensor. This is leveraging Rayleigh backscatter that is inherent to all optical fiber. These fiber optic sensors are woven in on the loom of the webbing manufacturing process. Then once they're in the full structure, they can detect creep, loading, and damage throughout the entire inflatable habitat. We proved this concept using a subscale inflatable test article that was fabricated from representative materials and manufactured by ILC Dover. You can see in the center picture the assembled uh, test article. On the left, you can see the overall dimensions, 0.6 meters or two foot diameter, and 1.2 meters long or four foot, four foot in length. The Vectran webbings are attached modularly for the sensing straps. All the other straps did not have fiber optics embedded, but the Sensing straps were modularly integrated using shackles or buckles to be able to remove and replace uh, sensing straps so that we could try different configurations, we could replace damaged, damaged straps, and this worked very well for us. The first type of sensing we looked into was response to pressurizing the inflatable. Over on the left, you can see the layout of the sensor in one axial strap. So it goes up the left side and comes back down the right side. And there is a 180 degree turnaround at the top. The plot in the middle shows the distributed strain data measured by the high definition fiber optic sensor. And along the X axis is the length of the sensor and on the y-axis is the strain measured in microstrain. Inside this dotted area it is the left sensing region of the, the fiber, 
and this dotted region over here is the right sensing region. You can see that these are <clears throat> sort of a plateau of strain that goes up and down as the pressure is increased. This particular test was done after the inflatable had been at, at 15 psi for a day. We deflated it and reinflated and we were monitoring the strain during that reinflation. So if you average the those plateau strain levels um, and you try to correlate that to the inflation pressure, we found a very linear relationship here. We fit a curve to it, shows a very high coefficient of determination, R squared, indicating that this is an excellent correlation. And this technique could be used to infer uh, changes in pressure in an inflatable. In all likelihood, there would be dedicated sensors to monitor the pressure, but this would be a redundant way to verify that, that there's no loss of pressure. And the, these signals are looking at over the, the full length of the sensor. You'll see later that when we see damage, uh, it's a very specific strain feature or peak. Another kind of sensing that we performed was creep sensing. This was of most interest to NASA uh, as they had identified creep as a, a likely failure mode for long duration inflatables, thinking 10, 15 years in space. We performed a one month creep test at a nominal inflation pressure of 103 kilopascals or 15 PSIG. And we kept this inflatable in a temperature controlled environment. Um, we compensated for temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure in processing the data. And overall, you can see that the uh, measured strain in blue follows an ex exponential or logarithmic uh, growth, and uh, that is expected. That's part of the expected creep behavior. And uh, so when you take a step back, everything looks as it should be. If you zoom in on that signal, what you can find is that it is extremely sensitive and was able to pick up the cycling of the HVAC system in the uh, testing area that we had. Each one of these oscillations is the HVAC system turning on and off to heat the space overnight and then early in the morning. In the afternoon, the HVAC system turned off and you can see the smooth uh, shape of the, the temperature response of the inflatable. Because temperature affects pressure, that is the main coupling into the, this strain measurement. So we, the one microstrain resolution that we have in our strain sensors was able to clearly detect these kinds of variations that were on a magnitude of about 20 microstrain. Another form of testing we did with the small inflatable was damage sensing. This was uh, intended to prove, are you able to detect damage, stress concentrations, anomalies, um, trying to get at future use for detecting micrometeoroid impacts. We inflated the uh, test article and controlled and monitored that pressure and the ambient, ambient temperature. And we inflicted damage on individual straps using a pneumatic ram with a razor blade tip. So here in this image, this is the inflatable and this air compressor is powering this pneumatic gun and this is the razor blade on the tip. There's also a metal back plate that goes behind the front webbing and in front of the back webbing so that we never would rep rupture the test article. And we also actuated this remotely for safety purposes. We were able to inflict three millimeter cuts on the edges of these 25 millimeter wide straps. And you can see an example of a, of a cut right here. The fiber optic data that was recorded during these events uh, shows some very interesting uh, features. This is a high definition strain profile. We uh, tear the sensor before uh, looking for features. This would be after you've inflated 
your habitat in space, you basically initialize all the sensors, and then you would look for deltas from that reference state. And when we performed a cut on the strap at this location, you can see that the, the blue signal, which represents the bottom edge pass of the sensor, clearly saw a major strain peak at that location. The opposite side of the sensor on the top edge did see a strain rise, but not nearly the same magnitude. This shows that we can identify axially where the cut was and which side of the sensing strap experienced this. We also uh, damaged that same strap a second time um, one month later, and it was still able to detect uh, a cut. This time we did it on the opposite side of the strap, and you can see that the red signal representing the top edge strain measurement uh, shows the larger strain peak. This uh, ability to detect damage and where it is is a critical capability for inflatable SHM. You may have uh, remembered in the recent news they were trying to find a leak in the ISS and uh, this would allow you to rapidly pinpoint where uh, an issue would be. The next form of testing we performed was hypervelocity impact testing. This was done at the University of Dayton Research Institute, or UDRI, in their light gas gun facility. The gun we used is shown over here on the left, and uh, we shot small aluminum projectiles, roughly three millimeters and five millimeters in diameter, and the speed of these impacts was roughly seven kilometers per second or you could think of Mach 20. We also calculated the impact energy of each one of these projectiles as they hit our test setup over here. So this, this is a panel of Vectran webbing behind three instrumented layers of shielding. The shielding is uh, fiberglass um, and the uh, restraint layer is always uh, much tougher webbing. When a hypervelocity uh, impact occurs, the rigid object that's impacting shatters and uh, turns into a debris cloud and that hits the next layer and it shatters again and shatters again and this dissipates the energy and it's very effective for stopping these micrometeoroids. Uh, but <clears throat> if a micrometeoroid or debris makes it through that shielding layer, we need to know that the restraint layer uh, is still structurally sound. And if there is damage, how bad is that damage and where is that damage? The first impact test that we performed was with the three millimeter projectile and it impacted the shielding layers and uh, a small amount of debris made it through those layers and impacted the panel of Vectran webbings. But no debris passed through the panel of webbings as uh, determined from the witness plate behind the whole test setup. What you can see here is that we have fiber optic sensors mapping out this whole structure. And before uh, the impact, all the sensors are reading zero. After the impact, you can see that there are strain rises right in the vicinity of where the impact happened. The second impact was a higher energy uh, projectile, roughly four times the amount of energy. And it did pass through all of the shielding layers and penetrated and passed through the Vectran webbings. So this, is, this would simulate a catastrophic impact for an inflatable if it's made it through all the shielding and has passed through the structural restraint layer, then it would be getting to the rubber bladder layers that are holding in the air pressure. What we can see this time is that uh, the impact was so violent, it, it actually shifted and broke one of the webbings. And uh, the four fiber optic sensors that were in this setup, there's one, one fiber optic sensor that goes on the vertical outside, 
one fiber optic sensor that goes on the horizontal outside, and then one, ver one, one sensor that does the vertical interior, and one sensor that does the horizontal interior. It turns out that the center sensors were damaged or destroyed. One of them uh, stopped operating completely. The other was returning a partial signal. So we can detect from this uh, type of catastrophic impact that if a sensor in a particular vicinity stops working, uh, we know that, that something serious has happened. The adjacent sensors are still functioning even though they've experienced this huge impact. And uh, that can help you to localize uh, these larger, more dangerous impacts. So those results were very encouraging and have motivated uh, maturing the technology to a point where it could be considered for a future space mission. We are doing a NASA tipping point project right now and the point of that project is to raise the TRL or technology readiness level of the technology and consider it for uh, future designs. We're leveraging um, some work that Sierra Nevada Corporation has done with their large inflatable fabric environment or LIFE. This is a photo of the, the full scale LIFE module at NASA Johnson Space Center. This was done under the Next Step 2 program. We're going to use a one-third scale model of that and instrument it with fiber optic webbings, four hoop webbings and four axial webbings. And we're going to test that inflatable in the vacuum chamber at NASA Johnson Space Center. This will be a two-month creep test where we will be able to observe what the fiber optic sensors are reporting and we're going to compare that to photogrammetry measurements or digital image correlation, DIC, as that is one of the recognized methods of uh, determining strain in these flexible structures. So this test will validate the fiber optic um, measurements and will also give us insight into what kinds of strain features might arise before a failure occurs. To summarize the technical accomplishments of this research effort, we have developed a new technique of embedding fiber optic sensors in the flexible soft goods of an inflatable habitat to perform structural health monitoring. These multifunctional sensors can detect important things like creep, impact damage, and also independently measure pressure variations in the inflatable. We also performed hypervelocity impact tests at seven kilometers per second on panels of Vectran webbing, and we were able to detect the, da the damage and its location. In conclusion, this effort has addressed the two main failure modes of inflatables, creep and MMOD impacts, and the key is the embedded fiber optic sensors. We're excited to continue work developing a one-third scale inflatable for a two-month creep test at NASA Johnson Space Center. And our fiber optic sensors will be validated using photogrammetry or digital image correlation. The bottom line is that the safety of future missions to the moon and Mars can be enhanced through the deployment of embedded fiber optic SHM sensors for inflatable space habitats. The authors would like to thank NASA for funding this research through two different contracts. I appreciate you spending time hearing our presentation today, and if this is interesting to you, please feel free to contact me for further information or for transitioning the technology. Thank you.